Okay, um, hello, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for um, inviting me here, and uh, thank you, Liam, for such a wonderful introduction to the Brave New Now. Um, basically, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different things. Um, I run a program at the Royal College of Art in London, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the student projects um, produced on that course. And I also have a design studio, and it's sort of interconnected, and ideas flow from one to the other, but I'm going to talk about a project that's um, in progress at the moment um, later on as well. So like Liam, um, we deal very much with speculation, but we're at, kind of at the other end of the spectrum. We're using products and smaller objects as our way of trying to um, describe and explore different um, futures. So our main interest, or the thing I really want to talk about today, is trying to shift for away from designing for how the world is now to designing very much for how it, it could be. And that's very different from how it should be. How it should be is someone telling us the way the future is. How it could be is about generating many different possibilities for the future and having a discussion or a debate about what kind of future we want. And I'm interested in the role design can play in that conversation. So it's very much about a shift from realism to idealism. And idealism not just in the sense of optimism and positive thinking, but in the sense of really valuing ideas and thoughts above the stuff around us. And this, of course, is where speculative design comes in, imagination and, and design fiction. So for most of us, especially in design, when we think of the future, we think very much of predicting the future and forecasting it and trying to absolutely figure out what is going to happen. It's very much about trying to identify probable futures, and that's what we're trained to do as designers. Our education, our professionalism, our design methods, our awards are all geared towards doing this, whether it's new needs we might have in a few years or, or new markets. Once you move away from that, there's a much more interesting space. There's the space of, um, it's hard to see in my computer, potential futures. And this is the space of scenario building. For example, in the 70s, um, the oil company Dutch Shell used to generate alternative future world visions, not to try and predict the world that was going to take shape, but to make sure that if one of, say, five different worlds were to take shape, their company could continue to thrive in those worlds. So it would take into consideration massive economic shifts, wars, famines, things like that. So it's still very much dealing with modeling reality with a number of different realities rather than one. I guess the space I'm interested in is the one of uh, possible futures, which is where a lot of science fiction happens. It's much more about imagining freely um, how the world could be different, how everyday life could be different. And there's a kind of a limit. I guess there isn't really this artificial line between the possible and whatever's beyond it. But I sort of think of that as the space of the fantastic, of goblins, fairies, things like that. And the thing that distinguishes it for me is scientific um, realism that beyond that line is a world that scientifically just doesn't make sense. Um, there's a wonderful book by Michio Kaku called The Physics of the Impossible. And he looks at all the different things like teletransportation, time travel, all of these things, and does an analysis of how possible they are, theoretically or practically. And in the whole book, there are only two things that there is no scientific way of understanding at the moment. And one of them is perpetual motion, and the other is precognition. So it's a vast space, but that's the space, I guess that's the line for us. We'll play with um, economic realities, ethical realities, social realities, cultural realities, but this scientific reality is our, our limit, really. The thing that's most interesting for us, though, is the idea of um, preferable futures. At the moment, they seem to be driven primarily by industry, but we believe that design can play a part in having discussions about what kind of futures the rest of us would like. So it's not a, so the way of, of doing this, I guess, is we try to occupy these other spaces besides the probable, asking what if, speculating, imagining, looking at different alternatives for how life could be. And I think design is very good at taking abstract research and turning it into concrete and tangible examples that we can then discuss. So it's not about the designer saying, this is my vision of the future, and you know, what do you think? It's about making different futures uh, working with ethicists, economists, different experts, tangibilizing those, and then having discussions together about what kind of future we want. The bit I'm not sure about is how you then take those further to impact on, on policy and things like that. So my interests at the moment are much more on the methods and ways of doing this. So there are many, many ways of doing this. 
Um, I think you have to look out of, out of design to fields like physics, philosophy, ethics, and uh, borrow some of these tools, really, for um, exploring these alternative scenarios. We can hybridize them, modify them, but all of them offer alternatives to the cliched future um, vision videos that one so often sees. So we're also trying to explore, I guess, alternative aesthetics for the representation of the future. How do we present different futures in new and challenging aesthetic languages that engage us in different ways rather than uh, reminding us of the familiar image of the future. So I'm going to show a few different um, projects from the Design Interactions course at the moment that try to do this in, in slightly different ways. See if I can just get my mouse onto this screen. Okay, this first one is by Kafoy Chai, and he was very interested in looking at how um, he could build up... Uh, well, I'll show a little bit of the video first, and then I'll talk about it. So what he's doing here is something that I'm sure um, a lot of you have seen before, putting electrical impulses into the body and, and kind of making the muscles move, but he's controlling, he's at the back and he's controlling the guy in front of him, using him as a remote control. So after a lot of experimentation like that, he started to wonder if, um, if we can input electricity into the body and activate it, can we output electricity as well? Could you record the electrical signals generated by our muscles and build up a library, for example, of dance movements based on electrical memories generated by a dancer's body, and then later play those back through your body so that you find your muscles moving and responding in accordance with the dancers? So the project moved from a more concrete experimental phase into then a more speculative one, imagining this future library. So I'll show a couple more of his experiments. Later in the project, he worked, with, he worked with a group of dancers at the Le Bain Dance Centre in London, giving them a kind of experience of what it's like to have your body slightly controlled, and then working with them to imagine uh, a future form of dance, I guess, based on working with electrical impulses through their body. So at that point, again, it moves into a more fictional or, or speculative um, role. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the, near the end of the project, he did these performances where he would show his archive of historical dances, and then one of the dancers would simulate um, her body being controlled in a way by this memory bank of, of different dances.
So um, some of the projects that we do take um, an, a technology that's on its way, and rather than looking at how that might be applied to everyday life, look at what happens once that's applied and what kind of implications emerge. And Frederick Pohl, the um, sci-fi writer, once said that a good sci-fi story doesn't just introduce the car, it introduces the traffic jam as well. It's that looking ahead at the consequences that we're often very interested in. So with this project, um, Mark was very interested in when electric cars start to fill up our cities, the soundscape will probably start to change. And yes, we can use cars to simulate um, existing traffic sounds, or we can create new electronic sounds. But he thought this was an opportunity to create new um, urban, I guess he called it, um, city symphonies, where the cars work together, sensing their speed, proximity, position, to generate um, an electronic soundscape uh, for the city. So he developed this software to um, simulate um, how that might work. that we were just looking at in the video. So that's, I think, you know, the fairly practical end uh, for us. Um, other students start with almost a kind of a dream, a very simple idea, and then the journey becomes the project in itself. So this project by Marguerite Humeau set out to recreate the roar that um, extinct animals would make and to try to recreate it. So in the process of the project, she communicated with well over 100 paleontologists, zoologists, veterinarians, engineers, explorers, surgeons, ear and throat specialists and radiologists to figure out just how possible it is to recreate the sound that a woolly mammoth would have made. And obviously the rat larynx, the soft um, material in the troth, is the bit that decays and you, you can't find in any fossils. So that's the bit that you have to um, speculate around and that's why she had these um, discussions with all the experts. So in the end, she took some scans of um, elephants, uh, the closest relative, and then used the tissue inside their bodies to model um, alternative um, systems, and then worked with specialists to try and translate those into a more mechanical system. So in the end, she made this um, object. Um, that's the, the larynx, the vocal cords, the windpipe of estimated length and diameter. And she had um, a compressor driving the breath at um, the kind of um, estimated volumes. I'm just going to show, this is um, a video of a trailer for developing the project afterwards, but um, it gives a sense of the kind of sounds that she was uh, working with. They were developed, that's the, uh, a second version of the mammoth one that I showed earlier. And that's uh, one of the other ones. And at this stage, she worked with researchers at ERCAM in Paris to try and refine and develop the sounds. So other students look at um, alternative visions of today's society, uh, rather than trying to pursue a dream, an impossible dream, or, or imagine an alternative future. Um, this project by um, Xing, um, basically developed a superstitious trading fund. So he's kind of interested in the, somehow we think the logic embedded in algorithms is neutral or invisible, but of course all algorithms have some kind of um, 
values, morality, ethics embedded in them. And one of the ways he wanted to highlight that was putting a different set of values into an algorithm. So this algorithm was programmed to be superstitious. It trades differently on Friday the 13th. It reacts to the moon. And he worked with um, a programmer who develops um, trading algorithms to build this one, and then became a, uh, a fund manager and um, secured about 5,000 pounds of investment over a year. So that this um, algorithm, this superstitious algorithm, is actually trading on the market at the moment. It um, runs out in about um, two months. I think it's 12% down at the moment on what it should be. And he did all the kind of legal stuff, warned everybody that it was an experiment. But I think it's really interesting because it doesn't belong in this world, but it's fully functional, it's operating in the systems, and it's setting up a contrast with, I guess, the, the ones we have today, and kind of, I think, opening up a space for, for discussion about how exactly do algorithms get their morals? Um, is it from the individual programmers? Is it institutional? How can we have a discussion about how that morality is formed? Should we even have that discussion? Uh, and what, what, you know, what are the kind of scopes, really, for being involved in shaping how they work? Not technically, but in terms of their ethics. So this project um, actually, I guess, questions um, some of the technological dreams um, that we have around us, particularly the one of cloning. And he set out to basically try and produce an Elvis mouse. And he was able to find one of Elvis's hairs um, on eBay. We don't know how real it was, but it was sold and certified as an Elvis hair. And then have, it, have its DNA sequenced, then send that DNA away to a lab and have it put into a model mouse. And then the mouse would be subjected to one of those experimental environments you see, which basically he looked at key moments in Elvis's life that might have shaped his character, and then built experimental environments in the, following the logic of laboratory equipment for testing and stressing mice to produce the key moments of Elvis's autobiography. So this mouse with the Elvis genes would live in this environment. And he wondered if that would, in fact, become an Elvis mouse. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a computer model. And uh, this is, so that's the final one, just to give you an idea of, of scale. So obviously, you know, what he's asking with this is, so what exactly are we cloning when we clone? Yes, you can reproduce the genetic material, but there's so much more of, of us, of me, um, in, that, in that material that somehow is elusive. And yet when we talk about cloning, we somehow think of ourselves cloning the person, not just their materiality. So I think it was a very interesting project in trying to dramatize that idea and um, put it into an interesting uh, form. One of the problems with this was, although technically possible um, to actually do this, um, of course it would be ethically outrageous. And, uh, Unfortunately, it was reported in the press that he did, in fact, do this um, in one of the English newspapers, and it creates a whole um, major controversy around um, laboratories doing this stuff, which took us quite a while to um, untangle ourselves from. And since then, we've um, introduced a, a code of conduct uh, for students working with uh, uh, design fictions, genetics, and scientific partners. So um, over the last six or so years that the program has been running at, the Design Interactions program has been running at the Royal College of Art, we, we inherited, if you like, an interest in digital technologies from the, the previous course, which was set up in the early 90s. And during the last six years or so, we've been looking at how designers can engage with scientific research, broadening the technological focus, and looking for new methods uh, for design, new contexts where design can practice, and new roles that we can take on. And recently, we've been trying to move forward again. We've sort of been zooming out and wondering if we can look at how technology and ideology interact and whether design can engage at that level. And um, I'm going to talk about a project that Fiona and I have been working on that's beginning to explore that. And there's always this crossover between what we do in our own work as an experiment and how that feeds back into the teaching, but then also how the work that the students is doing um, informs the kind of projects and things that we'd like to investigate. So um, we've always been fascinated by these um, kind of extravagantly improbable projects. I'm actually very jealous as designers of the scale that architects can work on. This is um, a proposal for an airport that sits on top of a number of skyscrapers. Um, I couldn't find the source for this, so I don't know when it was, but it's quite a while ago. 
or this plane by Norman Belgedes from the 1920s. It's a nine-story amphibian plane, twice the size of a Boeing 747 jumbo jet. It has an orchestra, a gymnasium, a solarium, aeroplane hangars, and it could sleep 606 passengers. And uh, when you think of what we've got today with Economy I Airlines, you wonder how we got from this dream to uh, where we are today. And this was designed to be really built, but the thing that prevented it from happening, it was supposed to fly from Chicago to London, was basically financing. He just couldn't find a financier to back the project. So there's some of that happening again today, this kind of big, uh, bold thinking. This um, example is uh, uh, mining asteroids um, that's been in the newspapers about a year ago um, where Google and others have um, sponsored it. And I think it's really exciting that we're seeing this really imaginative, bold, you know, large-scale thinking happening again. But it still fits within reality, and it's very much about the technological imagination rather than the social imagination. So, of course, architects have been doing this for hundreds of years. Um, there is, you know, literally, excuse me, going back in time, there are books of speculative um, architectural schemes. This one is one by AMO from um, uh, 2010 called Enaropa, where they worked with the European Climate Foundation to develop a roadmap for 2050, looking at running Europe on a shared grid of renewable energy. So this, of course, is one image. There's a massive report that went with this. But I think it's really, it's a bit difficult to see, but I think it's a very interesting um, start of a conversation. So it's basically redivided Europe according to its energy sources. So you have the Isle of Winds, the tidal states, Solaria, Geothermalia, Biomassberg, and so on. And from this comes all sorts of um, discussions about shifting identities, shifting borders, new economic systems, and so on. So it's a very simple image, but I think from this very simple image, we can have very sophisticated and interesting discussions about the future of uh, Europe. Artists have been doing this for a long time. I love this project by Charles Avery, where he's been visiting an imaginary island for the last 10 years and building back, bringing back drawings, creatures, models, and sculptures of what he's seen there. And there's something interesting about walking into a room and encountering one of his found artifacts without any explanatory material and just letting your imagination work on it and seeing where it takes you. One of my favorites is this uh, book um, by um, Luigi Stafferini called uh, Codex Serafinius um, from the 80s. And basically, it's a massive encyclopedia of an imaginary land. A lot of it seems to be some kind of biological or biotech-based uh, um, culture. But as you can see, well, it's difficult to see, actually, on <laughs> that slide. But the text is completely imaginary as well. So there's absolutely no way to really know what you're looking at. Yet the book is completely compelling and engaging. And you could flip through it for hours, just looking at what's there and trying to interpret and imagine. And it's a bit of a cult um, item now. But for us, I think one of the most inspiring starting points for our project was this series of books from Sternberg called the Solution Series, where different authors reinterpreted um, existing countries um, for in various degrees of um, speculation. So there's a book of Scotland that talks about 100 different Scotlands from the most um, crazy to the most um, concrete. There's a book about Finland that looks at quite interesting solutions to welfare and the storage of nuclear energy and alternative economic systems. But of course, these are all written. They're, they're, they aren't design books, they're, they're narratives. So we were interested in doing our own version of this for England. We called it the United Micro Kingdoms. We imagined that Scotland and Wales devolved, and we were left with an isolated England that, can, that devolved further into four super counties. We wanted to do what Bruce Sterling, the sci-fi writer, has called tell, a tell worlds rather than tell stories, and see if dealing on the small scale of design objects, we could do this. So, you know, it's an artificial construct, so we needed something to generate what these four places would be like. We found these interesting um, diagrams, sometimes called political compasses, where um, left to right is sort of economic, um, on the left, um, it's economics controlled by the state. On the right, it's completely market um, orientated. And top to bottom is about, um, I guess, freedom of individuality. At the top, they make laws to control our behavior. At the bottom, it's totally in our own hands uh, what we do to ourselves. And uh, there's a wonderful website uh, called the Political um, Compass website, I think. And it asks you a series of questions, and then it positions you on a map like this, which is quite interesting. It also shows where historical and contemporary governments um, sit. So we took this as a starting point for our four um, super counties. 
And we gave each one a combination of a technology and a, a political ideology. Um, we are very interested in how, as I mentioned with um, Shin's algorithmical project, all technologies in some way have ideologies embedded in them. It's just that we're not always sure what they are. So on the top right-hand side, you have um, digital technologies and a kind of extreme form of market capitalism, kind of a bit, bit more extreme than what we have today in, in most of Europe and America. The top left one is a collectivist nuclear society. The bottom left one is um, social democracy and biotech. And on the bottom right, it's anarchy and um, self-experimentation, discipline, education, not so much about technology, but transforming the body directly. So um, we uh, basically divided England up into its uh, four zones, um, not very scientifically, although we have been speculating on how England might have got like that. And next we needed a medium to, to translate our, our thoughts into. And uh, we're very interested in how often historically in uh, trade fairs and, and future festivals, the car was used as a kind of symbol of, of dreams about the future. And of course they represent dreams of freedom and individuality, um, if we take the car, we can explore how a different political and technological interaction might give rise to different dreams that we could express through a vehicle. It's a fairly neglected uh, medium for critical reflection, but it's, it still has um, a history of presenting dreams. So we did um, some research into what we think of as cars from parallel worlds, uh, mainly designed by artists. And we also looked at... Um, Infrastructure. One of the interesting things about the car is we can deal with it on a one-to-one -one level, but we can also look at the infrastructure that surrounds cars and how they transform um, whole countries or nations and, uh, and affect things on a larger scale. <coughs> so we have four different groups. I'm only going to um, talk very briefly about two of them. This is a work in progress, so I'm not going to show the finished uh, results that they're going to be in an exhibition in May, but more the process that we're developing. So architects have a tradition of doing this sort of stuff, presenting basically mega plans and mega visions um, of whole countries, schemes, worlds. But as viewers, we always have to imagine what it's like to enter those worlds and, and live within them. Cinema does this brilliantly in science fiction, and in fact immerses us um, in the worlds, when we, especially when we actually go to a cinema and watch them. But I think design, as designers, we can present little bits of these worlds, and we can allow people to imagine what kind of political and social systems existed to produce these smaller um, design artifacts and objects. It's like going to a museum and looking at anthropological artifacts from historical societies, seeing the tangible, real things, but wondering what those societies must have been like behind the objects. And that's the kind of mechanism we want to use. So our thing was really, can we use small things to talk about big issues? So the first one is the Digitarian Society. This is based completely on digital technology and all its, in a way for us, implicit totalitarianism, tagging, metrics, total surveillance, tracking, data logging, and dreams of 100% um, transparency. It's organized entirely by market forces, so the citizen and consumer are essentially the same. Nature's there to be used up as necessary. It's governed by technocrats or maybe an algorithm. And it's, it's the most dystopian of our four scenarios, but when we presented it to people, they also said, well, actually, it's the closest in a way to the world we have today. So the vehicle we chose for the Digitarians is a self-drive um, robo-car or, or self-drive car, and uh, electric. And uh, today when these are being presented, it's, it's kind of slightly utopian, you know, the idea that you'll have a relaxed commute to work, socialize, chat, maybe surf. Um, the system will kind of make sure everything's um, spaced nicely and traveling at a good speed. But we're sort of less optimistic, and we think it's going to be a little bit more like economy airlines, where once you can use technology to control access to the roads as a limited resource, it'll be used to try and maximize um, revenue in the most extreme way, but still with some humaneness. So our system's organized, so basically power and speed, today's kind of dynamic factors behind a lot of cars, is uh, replaced by footprint, how much road it takes up in privacy. And the tariffs, it would be like uh, your phone tariff accessing the electromagnetic spectrum. The government would lease the roads to different companies. It could be Google, it could be Amazon, it could be Hertz. And then they would um, charge it out to the customers, the citizens. And it would be dependent on price, how much you want to pay, how fast you want to go, 
how close you want to be to other people, um, your priority if you're sharing, do you want to be dropped off first or last, and how much privacy you need. So the car would change in this scenario from navigating space and time to being a vehicle for navigating, or an interface, sorry, for navigating tariffs and markets. Every square meter of road surface and every millisecond of access at any moment is monetized and optimized. So the dashboard wouldn't have rev counters or anything like that. You would just have time and, and money. And then each of these vehicles um, represent that. And they're kind of meant to be unsexy appliance-like. They're not about the glamour of, of driving anymore, but just getting from A to B. So this is the base unit. Um, people stand to take up less floor space, and they can do their email while they're traveling. This one offers a little bit of privacy, but there's a, a, a higher archy there. You can um, face forward and charge a little bit more, or face backwards and save some money. This one gives you a bit more privacy, um, you, um, but there are four, so you have the problem of who gets just dropped off first. So again, you can pay more to be dropped off first or save money by being dropped off last. This one's probably a bit more expensive because you have separate cabins to have that feeling of um, being special, and, and obviously it's a little bit more private as well. If you're on the phone, people won't hear what you're saying. Um, but again, you have to um, figure out who's going to um, get dropped off first. So this is just a snapshot of the models um, in progress. But we imagine that the digitarians live in a candy-colored future. It masks a system that prioritizes economics above all else under a guise of consumer choice. Um, and these vehicles, are, since then, they've now got all sorts of um, tagging material and, and stuff on them. So as you might expect, Digiland is made of vast, never-ending plains of tarmac across between um, an airport, runways, sports fields, and car parks. And we're working with um, a designer and animator, Nicholas Myers, to visualize um, some of the situations that might arise as these cars move this land through this landscape. And I have a few um, clips. Um, they're not the, the final clips, but they're clips that um, are on the way towards the final um, uh, film that sort of give an indication of some of these situations. So obviously a technology like this, everything's controlled by software and algorithms, can be used to optimize the use of the road as traffic flows change in relation to demand. But all is not equal. Why do some have to stop and others don't? Some people pay more. You have more privileges. <laughs> Technology could be used to make for an, exper an amazing experience, computer controlled spacing of traffic, use of the roads, but somehow we get the feeling it's going to be used to maximize um, revenues and set up hierarchies and distinctions and privileges. So we feel this is probably going to happen. And can we, you know, we're interested in using, can we use design to sort of fast forward to an exaggerated situation and have a discussion maybe about how to avoid this and make sure we don't end up with the economy airline model, but something uh, maybe closer to um, Norman Belgedi's model. So a whole sort of different logic would amount, would evolve based purely on economic um, differentiators. So the second one, final one I'm going to talk about is the Communo Nuclearist Society. It's a no-growth, limited population experiment. Excuse me, they depend entirely on nuclear energy and the state provides everything. So although they are energy rich, it comes at a price. No one wants to live near them because of the risks and because of jealousy in a way. They have this uh, apparently idyllic lifestyle. So they're a highly organized, highly disciplined, mobile state. They can never stop and, and settle. So we're very interested in the state literally becoming a giant vehicle. And uh, this one on the right, up until recently, was the largest land vehicle. It was designed and built in the 70s for moving um, rockets um, around on the NASA um, uh, space camps. 
It was called the, the Crawler. And throughout history, there's always been these kind of fantastical projections. I mean, in architecture, there was the plug-in city by Archigram, but there's all sorts of other visions of mobile cities. This one on the left was also nuclear-powered, um, I found out later. At first, we thought if it was a shared micro-state mobile, everyone would have to live in a very dense, um, probably overpopulated um, environment. And we literally thought about, could we take a building and just mobilize it? And then later, we sort of thought, well, why can't it be a nice place? Why can't, you know, yes, it's limited, but maybe everybody's um, sharing the wealth, and it becomes a kind of a collective wealth where you can mix individual freedom with um, a kind of group uh, benefits. We started to imagine it then more as a, a mobile, inhabitable landscape, a mix of communal living, services, and individual huts. So we started to plot out what this might be like, some of the small buildings. One of the things we like to do, although our work is, is fictional, as I said um, in this slide with the different kinds of futures, we like to have a certain amount of, of realism, or plausibility at least. So we worked with an engineer to figure out how big these platforms would be, how long the train would be, and so on. And uh, there's a wonderful book called Lab Coats in Hollywood, uh, written by David Kirby, that looks at how filmmakers work with experts. And paraphrasing him, one of the things he puts forward, one of the ideas is that the role of the expert in cinema is not to prevent the impossible, but to make the impossible acceptable. And I think that's what we do too. We try to have something that maybe isn't going to really happen, but how can we present that in a plausible way technically, even if economically and socially it's just not, not going to happen. So there are 70 platforms, each 20 by 40 meters, running on two sets of tracks. So it's about three kilometers long. Um, we started to um, look at what this landscape should be like. Should it literally be a landscape, or should it be a piece of architecture? And at this point, it ceases to be a design proposal as such, and becomes a piece of design fiction. It needs to begin to appeal to the imagination. If it's a prop for a film, it has to communicate very precisely to move the, the story along. These are designed for exhibitions where people can spend a little bit more time with them, figuring out um, what's going on. So in the end, we settled on something that's ambiguously landscapey. It could be that this is architectural, built from plastics, metals, whatever, or it could literally be um, grass. It would be nuclear powered. Um, we think a thorium nuclear reactor would be the safest and, and best one. There's some snaps again of, of the model. The model is a scale model, but it's about seven meters long. And we wanted to design, we could go into endless detail trying to specify exactly how the factories and farms would work inside the mountains, but we sort of want people to wonder how many people could live on a structure like this? What would their jobs be like? What's the balance between living in the huts and uh, living in the communal quarters? So each of the ideas we've developed in this project offers trade-offs. No, none of them are perfect. Um, convenience versus control, like the digitarians, unlimited energy versus a limited population, like the um, communonuclearists, or individual uh, freedom versus hardship. We're trying to balance somewhere between providing enough information to trigger people's imaginations, but enough room for um, people to interpret how these might work. So we kind of want to keep some sort of improbability in there, something that's just not quite right. Um, they're going to be exhibited um, in May at the Design Museum. But one of the things we're doing before then is create, collecting a group of experts, um, a political scientist, a synthetic biologist, an ethicist, an e economist, and an author, to see if, not to validate or check the project, but to see if this kind of design can trigger in their imaginations a speculative economics, a speculative ethics, a speculative um, synthetic biology, and how design maybe can act as a catalyst for a different kind of shared um, professional or expert speculation um, rather than, than purely a public one, which could happen um, in the exhibition. And we'll um, transcribe this and edit it, and that document will, will be on the website uh, for the project. Um, so that's where I'm going to end. But uh, basically, um, we're interested at the RCA at the moment, in our department, in trying to develop um, partnerships. Um, so if any of you are interested in collaborating, please uh, check out our website and uh, drop us a line. I'm going to end there. Thank you very much.